pass from Havili was magic. The shift on for Crotty. Boom, far down you go, Quagat Smith. Me, oh my, I have enjoyed that. Yes, boy. Sit back, relax, put your belt on. Enjoy. Draft Rugby, the game they play online in heaven. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Draft Rugby Show, where we discuss fantasy rugby, the game they play online in heaven. We've got the entire band back together for maybe the first time since Super Rugby Pacific kicked off. Kargi, mate, thanks for coming. How are you going? Good, mate. Look, you know, you're trying to make celebrity appearances here. It's, um, you know, I decided I've got to come back because I've got to lift the level of this podcast. So, um, pretty stoked. Uh, I was able to get through all the rugby this weekend because there was only four games. Um, and uh, although it seems like you still weren't able to do so, but that's all right. Um, just, you know, I'm sure we'll hear some excuse about something you had on the weekend or whatever. But, uh, mate, how good has the rugby been anyway? So I'm um, keen to, uh, to rip in today. I, I genuinely thought it would have taken me more than 45 seconds to dislike having you back, but you blow my mind every week, mate. So congratulations. And Nelson, welcome to the pod. Yeah, it's good to be here. I was the only one of uh, the three of us to actually go watch the Waratahs, the only committed fan here. So, I mean, I'm, I'm topping the table out of the three of us as well. So it's it's good to be here, but I think it's really needed, especially with Kagi back to, to bring us down. All right, there's a lot of harmony in here. And Nels, do you mind just getting a bit closer to your mic? Because we can't hear a word you're saying. So, guys, for the entree tonight, let's talk about Super Rugby Pacific. We're going to split the podcast or the Draft Rugby show into two episodes this week. We're going to do the review tonight because we thought that it was a bit a bit more palatable if they only had to put up with us for 25 minutes or so. And then we'll do the preview on Wednesday when we get most of the lineups out as well. So, like, the big talking points for this one, guys, obviously the number one thing is more COVID disruptions in Super Rugby. I'm going to call it Aotearoa. Yeah, that's it. Um, it's an interesting one. So, I mean, look, essentially two of the three games called off in the New Zealand conference um, with some widespread uh, COVID. They're kind of a few months behind we are in Australia in terms of opening back up and just, uh, you know, the concept of living with it and um, getting ahead of it. So that really sucked. I mean, I saw one of the headlines said um, the Crusaders, you know, were missing half of their squad and didn't want to play a Crusaders-style uh, barbarian team. And I was thinking... Well, they probably have enough depth to do it, actually. So they're the one team that could probably just field a B team and it would be fine. But um, yeah, a couple of weeks ago. Maybe they'll do that against um, the Aussie teams. They'll be like, oh, don't worry if we don't half the, half the squad. It's fine. We'll still play. Don't worry. It's fine. But um, no, a bit sad to, to have no games. But clever in that they did reschedule that Chiefs uh, versus Moana Pacifica game. Um, certainly really made it really confusing for us in terms of our fantasy uh, competition and our fixtures, how they are working, you know, uh, lining up. Nelsie, you can probably explain a bit <laughs> better how that's yeah. working. Well, I mean, what we've done is every game is locked, basically. So we hadn't finished round two because the Moana Chiefs game hadn't been played. So because that game was played this week, if you had a Moana or Chiefs player in your team, they did not score for you this week because technically they were playing for round two. So our round two is now finalised. We have results there. But those teams, you could have had Narawa on your side and he, he didn't get your points because he hasn't played technically in round five yet. Yeah, so essentially in our round five fixtures, we've only had the Aussie games go ahead and all yeah. three of the uh, Kiwi games in round five are delayed until those rematches. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot going to be a lot to stay on top of it. But um, And it certainly made a bit of a lottery for, you know, are your players that you had in that, that game week in your lineup playing in those rematches. And, uh, you know, we think we'll certainly see, particularly with a lot of these rematches being made up midweek or two games in a week, things like that, we'll see a lot of the extended squad being pulled in. So it's going to be a real roll of the dice to whether your players play think, in those fixtures. I think it's worth comes noting... Back, which comes back to the foresight of, I know I discussed with Nelson... Uh, pre-initial draft, just trying to avoid the Kiwi players at all costs. And he followed through with it, and I did the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah no, it was my idea, and I was the only one that did it. So that was a good good decision, I think. But look, the, the Highlanders-Moana game, I mean, will be, I think will be played on the weekend of April the 8th and 9th. That's when they both have a bye. So my assumption is, you know, they've technically both had a bye. Highlanders this week, Moan have had a couple. So I don't think they'll be a mid- midweek game. I think we'll, we'll see a full 
full, you know, six games of five games. Yeah, exactly. And and obviously they've expressed like they don't want to they don't want to cancel any games because obviously that ruins the whole competition on the table, and they don't want to extend the season on. So they've, they've that's very important in that these extra made up games must be made up during the course of the season dates as it stands. So um, yeah, think, basically, basically got to really just stay on top of one of the fixtures. So I, I think I speak for all Aussie fans when I say I hope the Kiwis play all their midweek fixtures between playing us. So we get one game a week and they have to play two. I think that's the most fair way yeah. to push yeah. forward in the back half of the comp. Or even, fur- even further, Harry, this, they send half their squad over to Australia to play us and the other half stays behind, you know. So send you, send the B team over. That's fine. That works for us as well. That's great. Yeah. I like it. So, guys, what about um, the scores from this week? So the first game of the week we have here is the Brumbies versus the Reds. The Brumbies getting up 16 to 12. Nels, how'd you see this one play out? Look, I, I think people had different opinions about this one, but for me, this was a really hard-fought physical game. Um, it, it probably wasn't as flashy as the last three times, you know, last season that they played each other, but it was definitely a, a colossal battle in tight. Um, so I, I think it was a game where two teams really knew each other very, very well, and they had a real physical battle to stop each other's attacking weapons. I mean, a perfect example of that was that Hunter Paisami tackle on Alola CEO. Huge. Um, we, he snapped him in half. Look, I, I mean, he's, he's the chiropractor 2.0. Like, what, do we, what do we call him? Do we call him the hitman? Maybe the Samoan headhunter named after that, that wrestler? He's going to have his own nickname, right? I mean, nice. his first name is literally a nickname anyway. Yeah, but <laughs> the hunter, it just doesn't seem clever enough. Yeah, I don't know, mate. He's look, he's the hunter and he turns you into a pastrami sandwich when he's done with you. So something it's gotta be something along <laughs> those lines. Um You're just gonna say that in title. I mean, look, they said the first season he came into the Reds after the uh the Rebels didn't want him or whatever. Uh That's you asked happened. anyone in, you asked anyone in the team and they said he was definitely the hardest hitter in training. You know what I mean? Like just uh I love that he can do it all. But um I was just Harry and I were having a good froth session just before we jumped on for the pod about Hunter and um, just saying, look, when he's playing like that, he's my, probably my favourite player to watch in, in Australia, you know, and that's that's a huge call because Tong and Thor is in this game as well. Yeah, it was it was a funny one. What, what did you guys think of that Tong and Thor clean out, Harry? Did you see this one? No, I, I genuinely didn't see the uh, this one there, so I'm probably the worst one to answer. Kagi, what's, what was your opinion on that clean out? Look, I, for me, it wasn't it – was, it was a clear out – very, very close to being a perfect clear out with mm. um, uh, Brown lent over. Was it Brown? Um, yeah, lent yeah. over the the rock. What do you, how did you see this one going? Look, I'm glad that you went first to describe it again for me because I have completely forgotten this one. But um, yeah. uh, I remember at the time <laughs> thinking, like, he's, he's gonna they're gonna review this and he's possibly gonna get sanctioned midweek. But you know, it is hard. It's the, <laughs> You only get so much room to hit these guys, right? But um, I don't know. The, the, the difficulty was, I mean, there was a law that everyone talked about, you know, in previous years that the head can't be under the waist and stuff like that when you're, you're going for the ball. And, and really, I think it was Brown's hands were on the floor. Like, he wasn't even going for the ball. So he probably mm. shouldn't have been there in, in the first place. Tupo kind of had a bit of a cocked, cocked arm when he hit him with the, the shoulder, which, which bounced him back. But... I think they're saying it looks like it brushed his head or something along those lines. It, it to me, yeah. it didn't look like it. But there's not a lot of things that Tupo could have done to get him out when, when realistically he was in a legal position. But the one thing I would say is, when's the last time you've seen a crocodile roll there? You know, where Tupo flops onto the back of him and rolls him off. I, that'll destabilize him for sure. Well, the- I, I thought they tried to get rid of that as well because it was busting people's knees. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. Just this- do we let him go? Just let him play. Is- this is the issue. It's it's a part of the game that there's no real solution for in terms of player safety. Like we've talked, we've discussed this at length before, but it's just, you know, you, you've got to stop the players charging in off their feet and just hitting them, but they have still have to get there at light speed because if a, if a guy's over the ball contesting it for a second, they blow the penalty. Um, but what they want is people to come in, slowly grab them and hug and fall. But you're right. They're, they're against the crocodile as well. Cause that was seeing heaps of knee injury. So there really isn't a solution with, which doesn't ruin this facet of the game. So I, I don't know what you do, but I, I'm looking at this right now. And like, 
Jerome Brown is so clearly hand on the ball, head down below his hips, not supporting his own weight. There is absolutely no way that Taniela Tupo can both come through the gate and hit anything other than his head or above shoulder height. That's There's no exactly, option. Yes, yeah. exactly what I've said. You know. Yeah. And, and to get and to, as a big man as well to get as being a big man myself to get down and clear someone out at that level. You know, you, you've you've gone well past your center of gravity long before you get there. You know, you've committed yeah, yeah. To, to taking them out. So yeah, I think you did very, very well. But yeah, yeah maybe let's move along. Let's yeah, talk no, a bit look, about that for a I, bit. I, I, I wanted to say just Nelson, you mentioned mentioned a colossal battle this game, and yeah. what a colossal battle in the set piece. This was one for particularly the scrum fans. So I was absolutely <laughs> loving this, and momentum kept swinging both ways. You know, it was all the the Reds were up and uh, were winning a few scrums. Then it was back on the Brumbies, and that was just for me. That was what made the match. Really, it was you know an all Wallaby front row for the Brumbies. Versus Taniela Turco, really? That was, um, you know, <laughs> no, no discredit to uh, to NASA and uh, was it? Well, it was Xander as well. But um, oh, so epic those scrums! It was really good. What did you guys think? Oh look, oh, this this was a great game. In, if you liked the Wallaby matchups, for me, the the Wallaby matchup that I was most keen to see was definitely Pattaya versus Banks. Um, Banks, yeah. you know, the incumbent, been playing very very well this season. He he couldn't really find a hole in this Reds defence to, to, to make his way through. And, and I think that's saying a little bit more about that intensity of this match. It was that kind of test match intensity. Um, but he didn't manage to find his way through, which is a little bit of a concern. But for Pattaya, he, he doesn't still look like the rounded fullback. He's still trying to find his way into maybe some positioning and a few things like that. But right now, just the elite athlete he is, is doing enough to get his name in that conversation absolutely and it's exciting it's exciting to see him you know just have that bit of extra time and space um yeah, yeah, you know definitely. on the wing on the wing you only it, it's rare that you get a lot of space um but here he's getting he's getting to choose where to inject himself which is what's exciting i think so yep. and very very interesting now that Jock campbell is also in the wallaby squad and has been named as you know his best position being a 15 so there's some real depth there for the group <clears throat> I had uh, the the one for me, guys. We talked about the uh, Taniela two post siding. How about um, Fraser McWright being pulled back when oh, he yeah. looked like the certain favourite to score a try? And I think because he got pulled back, the ball kind of beat him at an awkward time into the post, yeah. and it hundred percent cost him a try. I should say ninety eight percent cost him a try. All he had to do was pick the ball up. And they don't even look at it. Like, no yellow card, absolutely nothing. Like, how can we possibly think that this is okay when we're interfering in such rudimental stuff and letting that go? Yeah, this this one was baffling for me. I, at the time when I saw it, I'm like, well, that's clearly getting called back. And I think the, the ref pointed it out and said something. He goes, oh, no, it was okay. You know, it just didn't really even bother to sort of look into it. But... I mean, that's, that was one of the things about this game. There was those fine margins, especially in defence. That that one's baffling to me. But there was only three games scored, the three tries scored in this game, but it, it could have been six because, I mean, McWright could have scored that one. Um, the Reimer made it a break, didn't pass it to Mog. Absolutely and butcher. That, yeah, and, and James are kind of making that tackle on Brown on the sideline. So, I mean, it was it was a game where you could have had a lot of tries, but defence was the game that won this one, the thing that won this game, I think. And don't forget the uh, the bomb that kind of almost landed in Fraser McWright's hands over the try line, and he knocked yeah. that on as well. Great. So many opportunities for the Reds to cause, a, I think, cause a massive upset. I, I can't believe it was as close as it was. It was a very weakened Red side, and they, they gave it a fair crack. But hmm. it, first instinct was this was poor from both teams, but on, on re-watching it, it's definitely the intensity that they both brought, which disrupted each other. Yeah, but, on... on, on just, just lastly on the, on that um, Frasmer being held back, I, I was surprised he wasn't absolutely blowing up. I don't know if he was captain at that point, but um, I would have thought he'd be losing his mind. Uh, maybe he was, and we just didn't see it. But um, yeah, it's I interesting. He, it's, it's interesting that yeah. the ref. I felt like the ref didn't want to make a call because that's the very end of the game. Didn't want to make that game deciding call, but in not <laughs> in not making a call, turns out he made the game deciding call. Do you know what I mean? Well, this, <laughs> like. The sad truth out of it is if he did what some players are doing currently and made a big deal about it in play rather than just trying to finish the play, it would have been reviewed. But instead he went, I'm going to try and finish this. And because of it, he was punished. And for me, that is what is most ridiculous out of this. That's a very good point. Guys, we'll, we'll, push on, 
we'll push on. The next game was almost my favourite game of the round for <laughs> nothing other than what could have been. The Fijian and Drua went down 18 points to 20 for the against the Western Force. I was watching this one with some of the boys at a Bucks party on the weekend. And they were saying, oh, who do you want to win? I'm like, ah, if the Force win by a fair bit, I'm happy. But if the, if it's tight, I really wanted the Andrua to get up and just have that story. And I, it looked like it was going to happen for a fair while. Yeah. It did. I mean, look, for mine, like, I think the Force definitely deserved to win. I think everyone would agree with that. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you know, whilst they had enough momentum and uh, they just didn't turn enough of their opportunities into points. But um, the, hu- the huge run for me out of this was the Force doing absolutely everything. Like, they seem just hell-bent on, on throwing this game away in the last 10 minutes. You know, they're, they're down a point. And, um, you know, I think the big one is they call for a shot of goal at, at 68, uh, sorry, 78, 68 minutes or 78 minutes. Um, 68, 68. 68 uh, and then decide, oh, no, no, let's, um, let's kick for touch. And then in the, in the next six minutes, they, they seem to turn over the ball like six times, I think, essentially. Mm. You know, I think they kicked it out on the full three times. Isaac Fines throws it out into touch. Um, they just would, made every wrong decision you could make in the last 10 minutes when, Oh, they just so needed bad. to remain composed. It was, I it think, was unbelievable. I think the fact that they haven't been, you know, necessarily scoring tries is, is starting to get to them a little bit. And they're starting to go, well, we need to sort of take points. We need to do things like this. And it's kind of disrupting what should be the normal flow of the game for them. You know, they they do have the ability to score tries. They do have the ability to, to put pressure on, you know, opposition lineouts and things close to the line. But they just seem to flop between those decisions it didn't seem like it was well thought out I mean there was another opportunity where they probably could have had a 10 meter line out or five meter line out and Kunzel just didn't even seem to kick it for distance he just kicked the ball 25 meters out you know like Mm. it's just something wasn't there in terms of the control and the thought process throughout this game for me and and that's why the game was close because otherwise I, I reckon they could have you know won it by a fair bit more and I think they they went about the wrong way as well by starting Ian Pryor for his leadership and cool head and then bringing on Isaac Fines in the, in the, in the crunch time. And I know Isaac Fines for the Brumbies was really clutch in one of those games, you know, scoring a try, I think to beat the Tars last year or something, but it seemed like a game where Isaac Fines has been in such good form. They need him to be able to score some tries and get the guys really going forward. And they could have really benefited from Ian Pryor in that last 10, 15 minutes, you know, like just, ah, it seemed a weird one. Completely. And I, and I think that's the thing, right? Isaac finds Lele Owasa is the guy that's going to bounce out from the back of the ruck and just cause a bit of disruption to the Fijian and Drua's defensive line, which might not be as strong as some of the other sides. Like mm. maybe they're not quite as trusting as organized, but yeah, they, they, they just don't, don't offer. It's almost like the Western force is just waiting for Matele to set up another drive for them. You know, like they look to their Fijian. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's- there's 16 okay. players creating stuff on the field and uh, 16 Fijians were the ones creating things on the field. <laughs> I think um, that was the thing, though. Like, they, they wanted to start prior because of his leadership and control and in a quite a, you know, threatening team like Fiji and, you know, not necessarily an orthodox team in terms of what are the, most of these players play against. I think they thought that control of the game was what was needed. And that, the sad thing was... They didn't have that control of the game. So it, it seems like a, a real missed opportunity for mine to, to really take that game and, and control it early. Yeah. And the, look, I'll just say one, one last point about the force before um, pretty much everything else we wanted to talk about is just how good the drill were. But um, was uh, Tim Anstey on the bench? For mine, that was an interesting decision because I thought um, he him at, at number eight has been um, you know one of the brightest sparks along with Fergus Lee Warner just a really good balance there with Fergus Lee giving those carries and Anstey um, just as like, you know, an actual offensive weapon off the back of the scrum, uh, kind of also a bit of a, you know, good jackler and things like that. And, and has also been really good in the line out. So uh, I was surprised by that. I don't know if he had a niggle or anything, but um, I think that made a big difference. I, I think it was representative of exactly what we just talked about with Ian Pryor. The Force's entire selection was about having muscle composure 
and experience in the side rather than strike power. Like they had Thrush back in the locks. They pushed Fergus Lee Warner out to the back row, which means they had a big uh, line out. So then that way they could try and kick some corners, slow the game down, play the set piece game. Like that was clearly their tactic, but they just weren't composed enough. They make too many mistakes. And, and really at this stage, I don't think their set piece is good enough to actually score them enough points. So they need to find a way to score. Um, Mate Elliott 10 is my current solution, but I'm not sure if you guys are on board with that one or have got any other ideas. Oh, look, I mean, I, I want Pasatoa back at 10 as well. That was another another one exactly that, that, you know, feeds into what you were saying. I know he hasn't exactly lit it up, but, I mean, he does more than Jake McIntyre does as far as I'm concerned. I'm not going to not going to give Jake McIntyre any air on this podcast, but, uh, you know, I've never been a particular fan. But um, look, you're right. I think they just need... They need to score points. They need to score tries. They need to they need to be exciting like the Drua. And talking about the Drua, before we actually talk about their absolute weapons and how exciting they are, it's funny that we just talked about the Force wanting to play the set piece game. And, you know, everyone's been talking about the Drua getting better and better each week. And a, a large part of them getting better is they have really started to settle into some structured play. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, we know they're amazing in, in the loose, um, very creative. But their structures are getting really good. Their McBurn structures and their set piece is starting to get really good. Their scrums, the two props are absolutely making waves to walk in. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you. Um, and yeah, just like we're seeing that translate into a lot more controlled ball for them and them not kind of panicking uh, around as much. So um, yeah, it's interesting that the who flip sides of this coin in this game, two narratives. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot of players that are really sort of carving out their name. I know we touched on it before the season started, saying that there's going to be a lot of household names, you know, not long into this competition. And there definitely are some very quickly off the top of my head. The first one that comes is Habosi. Um, he's 21 years old, and we all think he's probably the form win- winger in the Australian conference, which is concerning because he's not Australian, but he's also... <laughs> not an Australian playing for not an Australian team. We always have good Fijian wingers, but at least we can claim them to be Aussies, kind of. But, um, yeah, no, he's just effort around the, the park. Kagi, you think it's Corumbeti-esque, Cor- Cor- but I'm not sure. But he's got huge, huge work rate and ball in hand. Boy, he's amazing. Honestly, yeah, I just... The you thing that impresses me the most with him is just his growth from the first game. Yeah. Watching that first game, he made so many terrible decisions, which showed that he had no understanding of how composed and how risk adverse you need to be to play at this professional level. And he seemed to have fixed it within a week or two. And now he's making so many more good decisions. Not perfect, but geez, he's grown a lot and so fast. And he's just so deadly. But you add yeah. to that the depth of uh, the, the centres, Revalvo and Botta. Like Vot, Vot is, I think, still probably the top tackle buster in the competition. Can't <laughs> confirm that, but I think he is. And then how about the revolve our break? Just like he, he just had a look at the defence and from about 10 metres away from the line, yeah. put his foot on the gas. And the other team, like the forces had absolutely no chance. And I, I remember I was watching this game again in the pub and just showed it to everybody else and put on replay. I'm like, hey, guys, like the, the Drew are just going to smoke all the Aussie teams in a few years. Like it's just mm-hmm. so unfair. They're just the most outrageous athletes. I mean, we, we called it at the start. The NRC just took a little bit of time. As soon as they start playing together, they're phenomenal. But the only thing Fiji needs to be an absolute, you know, world power at rugby is some professional teams that they can play and keep their players for them. Like, they are just absolutely phenomenal. You seem to pick anyone playing an okay level of rugby in Fiji and they can just set the world of rugby alight, I reckon. That's it. And look, just highlighting the last few players, I'd say, uh, Joseva Tamani, um, the six, he had an absolutely brilliant game. So after last week scoring that, you know, 90 meter, 80 meter try or whatever it is, where he just burnt everyone um, as, as a loose forward. And this week he was just into everything and they could not stop him offloading. I mean, you know, Sonny Bill made offloading look easy. This guy maybe made it look even easier. I think, you know, the stats have him down for three offloads, but I'm pretty sure I saw four or five on that game, but um, he was brilliant. And uh and also, I thought Frank Lamani being introduced, the Fiji test uh, scrum half, uh, was really good. Just bringing, just making some good decisions for the team. So I thought it was really good. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, let's um, let's go on to the next game, the Kiwi game for the round, the Altaroa game for the round, Moana Pacifica versus the Chiefs. 
The Chiefs obviously were strong favourites after their 61-7 to thumping in the preseason. This one's slightly closer, but it wasn't a whole lot better. 12-59 to the Chiefs got up. That's two tries to nine. Yeah. Oh, mate, it was huge. Um, I think I literally just said copy and paste that uh, that headline um, for that article from preseason. Uh, and look, you know, similarly to that, it was with a bunch of, um, you know, I'm not going to say second string, but not their starting players, you know. Um, the Chiefs, I, I feel like all you need to know in this game was it felt like uh, the whilst minor Pacific has started well, the Chiefs were just kind of building um, and slowly increasing the pace of the game and just waiting for minor Pacifica to collapse. Um, you know, I think the Chiefs really just absolutely dominated the match with ruck speed, some awesome hole running, um, and just basically turned all of their opportunities into points. Um, you know, minor Pacifica did show some great <clears throat> promise, but it's, I don't know if it's the co- cohesion is not quite there or just um, unable to follow through on some good play and back it up with, you know, more, more play and turn it into points. Yeah, there's probably a couple of things. I, I think the effort against the Crusaders, they were probably pretty emotionally driven because of the momentum, the uh, massive, massive occasion that was in front of them. I think it's going to be harder to back that up week after week against such quality New Zealand opposition. On top of that, this is only his second game together. I think it was the Chiefs' fourth game of the year. Like, even that is a massive, massive difference. The Chiefs are going to be into the full swing of things. They've had some hard matches and really got their, their systems going. So it's, it's just such a hard position for Moana Pacific. I really feel for them. And I think, you know, if you put the, the Waratahs in there in the same position this year, probably wouldn't be looking too much better. So I uh, I, I do uh, feel a little bit sorry for them. It's, it's going to be a big, tough challenge for them to try and come back from this. I think they just need to be, you know, given some time, to, some time to to evolve and find their feet. I mean, Fiji is a different story, and we weren't sure which one was going to come out on top, top sort of early on. And there's a lot of good players in this Moana side, but most of them have never, you know, a lot of them have never played together. You know, different coaching structures, very different level to what they a lot of them are used to. So. They just need some time. They, they need to get into their structures. And I, I do think there's some, you know, some green shoots there. So I think we just need to lay off them a little bit in terms of, you know, media and things as well. Guys, yeah. if you're looking for a standout, I'm, oh, no, I'm getting it wrong. I was getting excited. But how about uh, Christian Leila Um yeah. First start back for, again in a long time. He just looks like he never ages. Well, he doesn't look like it, but he plays oh. like it. Massive line break, set up another one. Like he's just got all the skills, and it's pretty tough for McClutchy when you got someone playing that well. Well, look, I think McClutchy, like he surely had to know he was here learning off the experience of Lily Afano. Sure, there's a chance that they could play 10 12, but there was always a chance he was seen as the, the second runner evolving his way into being a starter for them. I know he got the, the first crack, but clearly if I know that that cut out right to left, you know, two over two or three people would have set up that first try, um, as well as just hitting the line, making a break, a few different things. He he's just showing his level headed and experience. And it's what you want to see from Tamua at the Rebels and we're not seeing. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. he's finding the ability to control some of the things around him. No, they're not getting the win, but he's showing that level-headedness that I think we, we should be seeing from these experienced players. Yeah, no, I agree. Look, I, you know, I love Lele Fano and I think he is having that really positive influence on a team Always. that doesn't have as much cohesion and a lot of absolutely brilliant individuals uh, who are all very young. So he is bringing that experience and really, really good decision-making. But that said, I think we'll see McClutchy and him kind of split a yeah. lot of time because, I mean, in that first game, McClutchy was electric. Um, yeah. He was making quite a few great line breaks and putting people through holes. So he certainly, I, I don't think it's going to be a case of he's going to be on the bench all season. I think we're going to see no. them chop and change. But um, yeah, it's definitely some good signs from him. Um, I think I just wanted to say, building on Harry's point about, you know, the Chiefs having played a couple of games and this being Wider Pacifica's second game. The other thing is the Chiefs, I think this is their third win from the last four games as well. So they're a team with their fin up, you know what I mean? Yeah. They've got some momentum behind them. Um, it's all shaping up well. I've had a few good players come back. Um, so yeah, it is, it's when, when you kind of, when you're, when you are winning, um, you know, things, those extra passes just stick and things like that. And so 
for Moana with such a weird season, like weird first season, they've been particularly disrupted. Obviously, it does not compare to the the Drew up. It's um, it's been tough. Yeah, look, I've got a question. Maybe I'll throw it to you, Harry. I mean, the that center partnership of Danny Tuwala and Leva Amua has been really, really just damaging for for Moana. Um, do you think it's it's worthwhile. Do you think we'll see Lili Afano coming into that 12 jersey? It's really going to change the dynamic of that back line, but maybe it's something that they need. Rather than having those two ball runners, do they need a little bit more control in that 12 jersey? No, I don't think so. I think they control the, pretty get the game pretty well with just the, the one man um, shifting them around the park, to be honest with you. And as, as Kagi said, I think either fly half can do that they get a lot more punch out of Tawala and uh, and Levi Amor. So no, I, I don't think so at all. I think in, I think my my takeaway was very much that their forward pack needs to try and work out how to compete at the breakdown to tr- try and control the pace a little bit more. You know, the team conceded fifteen <clears throat> penalties a lot of those through the breakdown, and I think that's the Chiefs just had such quick ball. It just makes it hard for everybody else. I don't think having two playmakers on the team is going to make a big difference. They do look potent when they have the ball and an experienced fly half, either of them really um, have the ability to shift it around, I think, without that support. So, no, no. I maybe, so. maybe they need a few more stowers in the back row. Well, he, that's, that's, he made 22 tackles. I think that's really interesting because it, it's it's not necessarily the individuals in the fours. I thought the narrative of Moana Pacifica was going to be They've got all these individually brilliant outside backs and, you know, it's whether they can gel together to to score some tries. But I think the outside backs have actually all kind of been brilliant. And particularly, you know, I, I mean, I joked about the conditioning, uh, where, where all the players are going to be fitting in condition. But you look at Levi Amu and Tima Fayanganuku and they are absolutely shredded. Um, so I think it's actually a question of whilst, you know, when preseason we're talking about they have so many really good forwards, uh, particularly, I said, I think they have, you know, every single one of their back rowers is, is a number eight, really. <laughs> they just have like six or seven number eights. But the problem is, it, it really is set pace. So it's combining that they are just getting beaten up front by superior cohesive forward packs. So, yeah. and that is mainly around the breakdown, you know, like set pace takes a little bit to come together as well. But the breakdown is is where they need to put all of their work in at the moment, I would think so. Yep. Yeah. Massive, uh, just a ma- massive shout out to the Chiefs young blokes as well. When I saw the B team, they got named. And again, I know there was a few A, a players in there, but let's be honest, I wasn't a full strength side. Mm. I tipped the Chiefs to win by 20. Um, they won by 47. And one of the best that I thought was Hamilton Burr was awesome on debut as well. So just wanted to make sure we didn't only talk about Moana Pacifica. The Chiefs, <laughs> probably the young team, were very, very good. Can we, can we just point out how big that man is? If he's playing in the sevens jersey, He's 195 centimetres tall. I know, so I know that um, sevens rugby and this number seven are similar, but every time you call the open side flanker jersey, which you wore, why do you call it the sevens jersey? Well, the whole team should be the sevens, so they're the sevens. Well, Nelson Nelson has always thought, even if he's playing 15s, that he was playing sevens. As in he, Nelson doesn't see anyone else on the field to pass to. You know what I mean? He's kind of like Kobe Bryant, just like there's no one else on his team. So That's right. But, but now, Hamilton Burr, my question was, look, he was great, had an awesome debut starting game. Is he, uh, knowing that both of you don't think that the All Blacks captain, Sam Kane, is a particularly good uh, seven, um, is, is he also better than Sam Kane? Should he go straight in the All Blacks? Is he the next Lachlan Boshier or what? Um... You might have you might have jumped the gun a little bit with us or, or put some words into our mouths by us saying Sam Kane is not particularly good. I'm not sure we ever said that. Okay, um, right. Maybe maybe Hamilton Burr needs to show it against some more competitive opposition before we make any outlandish statements, Craig. <laughs> All right, but it's in the works. It's in the works. It's possible. We'll, we'll, we'll so, hand it to him that he's taller. He is taller. Yeah. All right. You found something else. Well done. And with that, look, let's push on. Um, you know, we can talk about Narawa for the next five days, but uh, let's uh, hit a great game. But let's push on to um, the last game of the round, the Tars and Rebels, um, which I was explaining to Harry. I sadly watched um, on the plane uh, on the way home uh, last night, kind of falling asleep. Don't but, feel um, bad, mate. I, I sadly watched it at the SCG. That was... That was crap. <laughs> that was so yeah. Yes, look, the, I was <laughs> going to say, mate, you, you probably saw about as much of it as I did because the SCG is, whilst a fantastic stadium, it's not a great place to watch rugby. Uh, really it. isn't. Rugby Com AU came up on Twitter saying I how it is to be back at the SCG. I just replied, it is not. <laughs> no one likes that stadium, Jim. I, I want to point out the highlight for that game for me was 
Joseph Swali is sitting behind me. And I was just started talking nonsense to them because they were calling for Teddy Wilson to get on. And I was just trying to gauge, you know, his interest in rugby. That guy, he doesn't know about rugby. <laughs> I said to him that, you know, he goes, well, why wouldn't they put him on? I'm like, well, like, obviously, they, if they're putting him on, they, the game's going to be very, very tight. They don't want to lose the game with the inexperienced player. They go, well, they just sub him back off. And it's like, you can't sub a benchy player on and off. And he's just like, can't you? Like, he just didn't know that was a thing. So... Yeah. He's, uh, he's league, but you can't you can't you can't do that in league either though, right? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah they've got a they've got a small bench. You can sub them on off. There's a show about league. There you go. Yeah, it's yeah, official. Sawali knows as much about union as Kagu does league. It's, yeah. So guys, talking about it's, the game, it's still, like, uh, still, we'll take Swally though, just to be clear. I will still we'll, take we'll, it. Just, we'll, just want to be 100 we'll on that. Yeah. The game, the Waratahs up against the Rebels, 24 to 19. There was a few good moments. I thought the one that stood out for me was for Keddie's run. They ran it off the. Uh, it was, was it a scrum? I think. I think it, it was, was a set, set. It was set piece. It was line out of scrum. But I just remember him. Uh, I, I think it was the. The first moment that um, what's his name, the reserve fly half came on, <clears throat> and um, they were talking him up. Obviously, we've been talking up for a long time that we really wanted Carter Gordon to start. He subs on for Tamua, who's gone off for an HIA, and immediately Fakedi looks at him, just goes, "You're not tackling me." Puts it under the wing and just goes straight through him and scores under the post. And it was just so good, and it's the confidence that we want to see from him. And it was a very good individual try. It was. Absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, we talk about um, Parisi bus every first tackle, doesn't matter. And for Kenny, you know, he has some of that potential. He just hasn't uh, lived up. So it's really good to see. That was a real simple, just really good hole running. And you're right. He sized up Carter Gordon, didn't he? I, I mean, I've got a whole point. I feel so bad for Carter Gordon. They're just kind of using and abusing him. The man just needs to be given that starting jersey week in, week out. And um, he shows some really promising signs. But if you keep, you know, putting him on the bench, kind of, you know, taking him off, he did does something bad, whatever. Like he had an absolute Barry Crocker of a game by all accounts. Uh, that one, he just nothing came off for him. And you know, uh, yeah. one or two, yeah. one or two more weeks of this, and he's you know, he'll he'll leave overseas or he just will be ruined right. forever. I think the difficult thing is like there's there's a good chance they just don't want to throw him in the deep end as well. You know, uh, for me, I think if he's a confident enough young man, you've got to get him on and you've got to give him a start, but. He was pretty crushed after that game. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, do they go, well, we, we show that we've got faith in him and we'll start him. Or are they worried that things well, might compound and it's going to get worse and worse? You know what I mean? Problem, like, the, the problem is it's much harder to now after that to yeah. start him next week. But yeah. if they had just kept starting, I mean, he, there's there's been times when he's looked really good. He throws a ripper ball out in front of some people. He's a big unit and he's not afraid to run either. He, he showed some really promising signs, but they just, it's going to be really hard to back him now. Is the problem. Uh, can we start calling him Mac Mason 2.0? Yeah? No. How do, how do we butcher this guy's career more? Mate, that's that's probably what we're doing. If, look, if we if we give him the sentence of death here on the draft rugby show, um, I mean, oh, that's, that's, that's going to get picked up by all the mainstream media and it'll be that'll be it. So we can't do that, mate. We want to see Carter Gordon starting, Matty Tamua supporting role in, at 12. He's 21, boys. He's 21. Like... Let's just let's just call the Jets a little bit on him and and hopefully see them utilize him in a in a good way. But it, it needs but, to be in uh, Speaking of Carter Gordon, how about that kick? Kick to like 70 meters. Yeah. Oh, no. it was like 60, but it was big. Mate. Oh, 80. Could have been 90. I, I, I watched it. It was 60. <laughs> I went back oh, and watched it again. I want to watch a forcing for, forcings back. Yeah, and, and the commentators go, he doesn't have it normally have a very big kick, but uh, I I want to watch a game of forcings back between him and Hodgie because um I think he's gonna be both. Big. They're both big yeah. units, and, yeah, they absolutely give it a good route. So, um, yeah. Carlo Tizano, guys, just to change topic, I thought he was awesome off the bench. It was good to see him showing some of the form that we saw last year. He's just a beast. He's <laughs> just – he's got so much aggression, and I think he's just got to be controlling that aggression in, the, in a little way. I don't think he, you know, necessarily got himself in any bad positions here, but in, in 43 minutes he made 15 tackles. It was very, very physical. A couple carries with tackle bus and a line break. He's got all the attributes, but he's just very much a young bull running at a red flag at the moment. And, and the more can he channels it, probably better. Do we call him the Parisi of the forward pack? Is that what we prepared to give him that title? You know, 110% angriest man in the forwards. Um, well, we've got Swinton. Don't forget Swinton. 
Yeah, no, Swinton, but Swinton's like the hit man. I don't think he's as angry as Dezano. Dezano is just angry when he gets on there, you know? Like, it's, it's like they've they've given him all, the all, in, yeah. all I know is our team is slowly becoming really angry, and I actually love it. <laughs> yeah. Holloway is up there too, so. Mate, speaking of Holloway, um, how good has he been? Um, as I think particularly given that leadership role, he's really, that's really helped him step up as well. Um, you know, he's playing 80 week in, week out. And he's finally becoming the player that we've known and really wanted him to become, you know, just um, I remember saying, I think, I don't know if I said on the pod, but I said after the first game uh, or the first Waratahs win in the change room afterwards, all the, the boys with their shirts off singing the song. And I was surprised to see, I was, I thought Jed was looking good, but I was surprised to see, mate, absolute six pack. The man shredded. He's in the fittest uh, form he's ever been. So he has just been absolutely awesome. Um, and he's getting into absolutely everything. So he's been great. Absolutely. And and just the way he, he's been so successful at holding players up in contact is awesome. Yeah. He's getting so many turnovers from that. It, it's Guys, what about mindset for him? Like he's just wanting to physically dominate people and take this chance because he you reckon he had unfinished business when he left and it's it's perfect, but it's sad it's taking this long, but awesome to see. Guys, I'm sure we're going to get our answer on Wednesday. But speaking of the fly halves for the Tars, obviously Donaldson went down with a calf tear. Uh, I think he said it, he felt a ping in his calf. But who knows yet if it's a one or two week injury or if it's going to be a little bit longer than that. But it didn't look horrendous, to be fair. Um, Will Harrison, obviously very good at 15, uh, was pretty good at 10, I thought as well, but probably didn't get quite the attacking opportunity that we would have liked to see from him. Do you mm-hmm. think Tane Edmund get, get Edmund gets the 10 and they just leave Harrison at 15, considering that it's working and they keep that dual playmaker role? Or do we get to see something different, like uh, an excuse to bring in Ram or Noangana Dawasi? I forgot that Tane Edmund existed until you just brought up his name. So I had already, I had, I had thought 100% Harrow's in at 10. But as soon as you say that, no, look, I think that's probably the go. Uh, Edmund in at um, at 10 and Harrison at 15. And look, whilst they've des- Harrison has described explicitly that he wants to be a 10 um, and that's where he sees his role, mate, he's, he's looked bloody good at 15. You can see why Coleman's been picking him there. I mean, apart from his great synergies, him and Ben Donaldson, who are really good mates and have played loads of footy together. Um, he just does look bloody good there. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. You I, I hope they persist with him at 15. I, mean, I think Donaldson and him uh, are yin and yang, and, and they're very different style players, but both really good distributors. And that extra time that Harrison's been having from the back is doing him wonders, and I hope we persist with it. If we think he is, you know, a, a potential short you know more than short term answer at 15 mid to long term answer then he needs to be left there i think um edmund i think is a really really good player i've got a really, really good boot on him as well he needs to be given that opportunity if ram had been playing you know the last few weeks and getting decent minutes it wouldn't have been you know as ridiculous to think we rush him in but we haven't even seen him this year so to rush him in there is not exciting for me and bring him onto the bench and I, I don't want to see Newsom there. So let's just leave Harrison there. <laughs> well, that's the other point, right? Like it's anyone but Newsom playing 15. But, <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, Edmed, um, sorry, I just want to say, I did think Edmed's really good. But what I would probably like to see is I would like to see Harrow at 10, Edmed on the bench. And I'd actually want to see the guy who we forgot about. He came off the bench this week. Mark here, I'm going to I say, I want to see him at 15. Get him on the field, mate. The worst game ever for him against an Aussie team probably is against the Reds because he's going to have to defend and... That's, that's not what we want to say. Yeah, true. But, I mean, look, whilst Will Harrison – well, no, actually, I was going to say, Will, whilst Will Harrison is a good defender, yeah, he's he is actually a really good defender. Mark, so. he's going to be rock sword under the high ball, though. He's a big unit with a high high jump as well. So, I don't know. We, we want him to be put under the under the pump in defence, to be honest. No, I want to see him come good. I want to I see mean, him look, I think, hard enough. I think what, and, we, what we can all agree on is okay. let's can we get Newsom off the field and please put Ram or Noahani Duase in the 11 or 15 jersey or both. Uh, and then take, take out the rest. Both but, off. Take, take Peach off as well. Sorry, Peach. And, I and like Peach. Both right. on. I, think no, I do good. too, but put Ram and Noahani Duase on. All right, and look, just in rounding out this game, I just wanted to say um, with a clear piece of strategy here, the Rebels have gone back to <laughs> the, the absolute approach of any time points are on offer, they are taking them. So they took, they kicked four penalty goals, which is what kept them in the game. Despite, you know, I think there were certainly times they really had some momentum and they going for touch or a scrum would have been a much better option. You know, let the boys play. Um, but 
they did also miss another two penalty goals and with those six points would have won this game. But um, like, I don't, well I don't want to say, I don't want to say it's just boring, but like it is boring. Just taking the, taking the kick every time you get the chance. Did you hear Michael Wells in the post-match presser? No, I did not. What is that? He basically said, oh, look, we're, you know, I thought it was a massive step in the right direction. We've decided that we need to grind. If we're going to be a team that grinds people out and hangs in the game, then we've got to take those opportunities. So essentially he said that they've changed focus and that's what they're going to do. They're just trying to defend hard, play field position and kick their points. They're not going to throw the ball around anymore. That's too unsuccessful. They're not ready. We yeah. All that says to me is we, we don't we don't back our backs to score tries. That's all that says to me. They, they, they listened to the pod last yeah. week. <laughs> to be fair, Kagi, that's exactly what Harry and I said a couple of weeks ago. They need to do use yeah. the boot. They know they've got to score tries, and they did it, and they almost beat the Tars. Yeah, it was pretty poor from the Tars to let it get that close, though. But how about we push on, guys, um, to finish off the pod tonight? We've got the fantasy players for the week. So we got the fantasy man of the week is. Calavetti Ravalvao with 58 points. I'm hoping that he goes up more once they do a, an updated count. So we can maybe give that on Wednesday if it jumps up. 84 metres off 15 runs for him. Two try assists, a line break, three tackle busts and two offloads. Just a wrecking ball in attack. And the uh, the other man who we actually failed to mention. I, 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 was a, I was about to jump in and mention him and then I saw his name was in here. So I'm glad. Kabus Ilof. 58 points, 35 metres off 12 runs, two offloads and a turnover. Mate, there's got to be some tackles in there, doesn't he? Where's the 58? No, and, and a try, mate. He scored a try as well. Uh, he scored a try last week. as well. He actually should, should have scored two tries last week, had a disallowed one. But, um, mate, he is into absolutely everything. Um, I can you know, tell you we, how many tackles. He got three tackles, Harry. So we, We've talked about how excited we are for Pony to, to come on back, but I don't know if Pony is going to uh, usurp him at the at the way he's playing. The, the bus, uh, he's, he's awesome. So. Yeah. Uh, fair enough, mate. They're, they're being very good. The other players I had here that were worth a mention was Amoni Narawa, who we've always talked already talked up. Fifty six points for him. Mm. Also, Fergus Lee Warner continues to go from strength to strength. Fifty six points. Then we had Brad Weber on fifty two, scoring another try, and Vinaya Humbossi fifty one points. So just continues to carve it up against the Aussie sides. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, the super sub, man. I was going to say, I actually said this pre-season. I think I said it to Blake. I was saying, if this bloke ever gets a run, uh, he's going to be in my fantasy team. Um, but Tyrone Thompson, big man Tyrone, uh, very young and up-and-coming hooker for the Chiefs. Uh, he did come on off the bench, scored, bagged himself a try, but God, he looks impressive. He's someone I'm excited for for the future. Um, and did you pick him? I did not. I did not pick him. You're, um, you're a liar. So, um, yeah. Kagi, I mean... You talk a lot of cuck, hence, if anyone's watching, they'll see where you're sitting on your video, mate. You're sitting on the toilet talking absolute poo, mate. But Captain Mud Award goes to Epi Ma'afu from the Rebels, and he was cuck. He came on, on off the bench and got a card, you know, pretty, pretty early, within a couple minutes, surely. He was atrocious. Yeah. Like Ulysses has that jersey to his own if Hanson's not around because Ma'afu was so bad in everything he did. How about his line out throwing? Like one oh, one he almost missed his own jumper because it went so far past the opposite outside shoulder. So atrocious. He, I think he clearly decided, look, I've had enough. This game's not going very well. Let me just tip this player upside down so I can take a rest and uh, we'll come back and try again next week. Yeah. That's another. <laughs> Another concerning thing is that's a minus 18 or, points. Or actually, then, I was going to say, actually, the, the team, like the coach sent down a message and went, all right, Marfs, you've been awful. Turn the next player upside down. We're getting you Elise back on. We need a legal way <laughs> to get him back on. That's probably what happened. It was, right? it was a ploy. I like it. I, I do like it. But the other concerning thing was Darcy Swain got minus 16 points. So there was some hot competition for, for the Captain Mud Rob Simmons Award. So... Yeah, no, Swain, Swain was, uh, you know, obviously given the role of um, the mongrel in the, the Reds-Brumbies game. And um, he just, he got into absolutely everything and was finally carded for just repeat, repeatedly, you know, aggravating everything, every break, every possible, I don't know, thing he got into. The little, little annoying things he does to the other team, I absolutely love. 
is mm-hmm. it's, is growing into it, and, and this was always going to be a physical game. I w- would have loved to see Luca and Salakai Lotto there as well because they go head to head, and that would have been great. And, and and although just just because we were talking about Darcy Swain, and I know we're rounding out the pod here, but um, speaking of the Brumbies locks, Nick Frost though I thought has uh, he has been absolutely excellent. So all three Brumbies locks were named in the Wallabies uh, initial training squad. Uh, including Caden Neville, who we just haven't seen and don't know if he's injured or what the deal is. A couple of weeks he's been injured, I think. No news. But um, uh, Frost has just been getting better and better, I think. He is, he's growing to be an absolute force. Uh, yeah. And even though he's, I think he's signed over to play in Japan next year, which is a yeah. bit unfortunate because it would be good to see him really push into the Wallabies. But it'd be um, interesting. I think the reality is with the, the depth that we have of seniors overseas and things, if they bring one or two back, like, He's going to be setting up for the next World Cup. So it makes sense for him to go and make his money for a year or two and come back. I I agree. And the interesting thing, I mean, he's he's 22 years old. Let's look at his career to date. Like, he took the chance to go to the Vikings from Sydney for the NRC. And then he went across to the Crusaders and he's come back into into the Brumbies. He's he's following some pretty good pathways and some pretty good teams to to learn. Now he's going across to Robbie Dean's team. Um, So he's definitely looking to develop his, his... gameplay and I, I don't mind it interestingly i mean we're, we're giving him a chance in the wallaby squad to go this is what you're missing out on and you could be doing so i, I think that's a, a little bit of a, a mental thing so Rennie can sit down with him but exactly I I was, have... mate speaking of his how good his resume looks and then after he's completed all these things obviously he'll have the um 2027 uh, rugby world cup wallabies win on his belt and then 2028 yeah. mate he'll sign for the most money ever signed in france you know what i mean but, it's all, it's all coming together Look, I, I, I think then the, and the other interesting thing is we're probably not going to see him actually get a run for the Wallabies, but if he does, in Japan, you're only now allowed two international capped players on the field. Let's just ruin the Japanese contract. Mate, I'm, I'm giving him a cap off the bench 100%. Mate, yeah. No way I'm letting that bloke go overseas without a cap. That's what I'm saying. Get him capped, ruin his contract in Japan. They won't want him as much anymore because he's a, he's a capped player. Yeah. That's, get him on the field. Absolutely. Hey guys, uh, any any other closing thoughts from the weekend? I've got one to finish on. Oh, I do. I, it probably is the same as you. Is it the Six Nations? No, you go. Do you hate the Six Nations? Well, how, how good is it for a long time? I think it's 2010 or something since we saw France, I, I think, win and they, you know, undefeated through getting a grand slam in the Six Nations. But that try, did you guys see the end of that Italy Wales game? Either of you? Oh, how good. Oh, Kagi, mate. Go look at it. The fullback gets the ball in for Italy. The young, on debut in terms of starting debut, fullback, mm. I think he's 21 or something like that from Italy, gets the ball on his own 40-meter line in the middle of the field, ends up running out on the wing, stepping a guy, and could have backed himself to go for the corner, but finds a perfect pass inside. They score under the posts, kick to win, beat Wales in Wales, the first win in the last 37 oh, games in six yeah. nations. So Capiozzo, that that um, fullback, he's only 71 kilos and 177 centimetres. He is tiny, but he's just got such quick feet and it could turn a pace. It was pretty awesome to see. And on that note as well, how good was it to see the uh, the player of the match, Josh Adams, trying to hand him his player of the match medal Legend. in the game as well? Oh, how good. If you also just goes, nah, mate, like you have it, it's yours. You earned it. It was pretty cool to see. Great to see. How good. Love that. You're going to have to check out that highlights for sure. And it, it just throwing on that point, the under-20s Italy team beat the under-20s Welsh team as well. So. Did they? <laughs> Very, they did, mate. There's, there's a yeah. few good signs. That's great. Yeah, um, except, except, who's, weren't they just talking the other day about kicking them out and putting South Africa in the Six Nations? So there we go. Mate, anyway. <laughs> mate, they were, but what the, you know the French 10, uh, Garabisi? Yeah, his, um, Italian his 10. Young, Italian, sorry, yeah. Italian, sorry, Garabisi. His younger brother is the halfback for the under-20s team and scored two tries. Oh, that's pretty cool. Going to have a brother, a halves pair. Garabisi, awesome. Garabisi, 9-10, how good. Yeah, beautiful. Hey. Harry, was that your point to round out the pod? No, guys, the, the last thought I wanted to make sure we didn't have anything to say afterwards was I just wanted to make a quick shout out to uh, to remember Alex Tarr, who's uh, one of the boys from the ERB podcast over in South Africa. Um, he sadly passed away. We won't go into any more details than that, but uh, he was just such a lovely bloke online, always keen for a chat, talk about rugby, always trying to just get everyone's name out there and really enjoy the ERB podcast. I think I think uh, that was one of the first rugby podcasts I really got into, to be honest. So yeah. Um, I yeah, just wanted to give him a good shout out. He was, a, he was a really good bloke. So very sad news. 
he, he definitely Absolutely. really helped us get our name out there. And I think that one of the reasons why we had a, a good following in South Africa and even to, you know, pre-season this year, he was he was messaging me about our scoring system and things so that he could get some more information out there to people to try and really help grow fantasy footy. And it's, yeah, it's it's, it's tough and, and he, he's such a lovely bloke. And I think Twitter, you know, the, the rugby community and Twitter is, is not going to be the same after it. Yeah, for sure. No. All right, guys. On that note, uh, it'll be a uh, short goodbye Wednesday night. Hopefully, we'll have all the lineups and uh, we'll find the games and pre- make some predictions then. So, see you then. And, and see if you can see the difference in Harry's face to whether he's had any sleep or not, you know, in those eyes. You'll, you'll catch it then. <laughs>